Welcome to Pop Stuff. This is going to be my comprehensive video for my first love, which is Star Trek. Star Trek, um, I was first exposed to Star Trek through its uh, reruns um, when I was a kid. Um, at that time, um, I think I was probably seven or eight, and uh, it was the original series with William Shatner um, and the rest of the original crew, of course, and I was blown away. It was awesome. Um, uh, at that time, uh, the only other thing that I was really exposed to that kind of sort of blew me away was Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, which was a sci-fi series about um, a U.S. naval submarine, a futuristic one, that um, encountered all these um, fantastical things under the sea. It was kind of like Star Trek. I mean, the ocean is a, a fairly unexplored. And then after that was Space 1999 which was awesome. I loved it. Of course, now you look back at some of the older series and uh, there's a amount of cheese with them. Um, they're not as good as you remember them. Um, but uh, Star Trek still holds up. Uh, yeah, Star Trek uh, was created by Gene Roddenberry with the help of many other people. Um, it was supposed to be what he called a wagon train in space, uh, which wagon train was also a, a, an older TV series. It's about life on the frontier, exploration, dealing with uh, situations and maybe conflicts. What I loved about Star Trek was it was uh, actually a positive uh, envisioning of the f our future. It was basically a utopia in the Star Trek universe in the future, in the 23rd century. Uh, poverty and crime uh, was gone. Um, people <clears throat> in the Star Trek universe, uh, they uh, were more into self-improvement. And uh, <clears throat> I like that vision. I mean, yeah, there's so much. There was, I mean, even back then, there's a lot of dystopian um, visions of the future. So I, I, I like, I love Star Trek. It was my first love. <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, Star Trek has always been relevant. To social social issues at the time, um, and that's where Star Trek always had its greatest strength. wasn't necessarily in the uh, special effects or anything like that, but um, it was the the social commentary about what was going on. Uh, back in the <clears throat> '60s, it ran from '65 to '68. It was a five-year mission that got cut short to three years, which isn't a re recurring theme in Star Trek um, and a lot of other franchises. But um, <clears throat> um, back then, they were dealing with the Cold War, racism. Sound familiar? Um, history repeating itself, but um, they, they dealt with other social issues too back then. So um, that's always been Star Trek's greatest strength. Um, then after um, it was canceled, uh, the fans didn't forget about it. And um, there were plans to bring out uh, another television series. That's, I think it was called Phase 2, t tentatively, um, and, and then Star Wars came out in 1977, my second love, in 
changed. Star Wars changed everything. So then they realized that, I don't know about this TV series, maybe we should make some movies. So they made some movies, which was Star Trek The Motion Picture, which uh, I liked it. From what I gather, Star Trek, the original series, was canceled because it was deemed too cerebral for the audiences. So, movie studios, television studios, they've always been denigrating to the fans. Star Trek was too cerebral. So, um, the, the motion picture was made and um, it was pretty good. It reminded me of um, an earlier episode in the series called Nomad, I do believe. Star Trek The Motion Picture dealt with uh, one of our Voyager um, spacecrafts that we'd launched in the 70s had been found by an alien ra race and given all these fantastic uh, abilities and it came back to find its creator. I mean, it, it's a fascinating thought about um, our, our search for meaning. But um, they're pretty good. I mean, spe the special effects were awesome. Now, they came out with a um, updated version of it, which is really good. It's even better than that one. Um, I highly recommend you checking out the uh, um, Star Trek the motion picture the um, I, I guess it's um, it's got some uh, footage and some special effects added to it then Star Trek Wrath of Khan which is most generally regarded as the best movie Star Trek has, has. Um, Nicholas Meyer directed it and uh, it was just amazing it was based on a previous episode in the original series. Um, Ricardo Montalban played Khan uh, in the original series. Uh, he was a genetic, uh, genetically enhanced engineered being from the, uh, I think it was 1990s, <laughs> uh, in that Star Trek universe, but it, it was awesome. Still to this day, uh, it's mostly widely regarded as the best Star Trek film. Then you go to Star Trek Three: The Shirts for Spock. You know the movies were in descending order from Star Trek Two. Um, <clears throat> I talk a lot about toys. And that history repeating itself keeps coming up. The movie you make today reflects on the one that you make. The next, or the, it reflects on the next movie. So, Wrath of Khan was awesome, but motion picture was, eh, eh, you know, so they didn't make a lot of toys. Wrath of Khan was awesome, uh, but they, you know, they didn't make any toys for the Wrath of Khan because they were worried it wouldn't be that much better than motion picture. So, Star Trek Three come out, and um, they made a handful of toys. Uh, its reception was pretty good. It's like the hit and miss with Star Trek toys. Um, but anyway, uh, then they decided to make another TV series, go back to a Star Trek roots was on the TV and socially relevant. And Well, and the movies were socially relevant, uh, especially the search for Spock, you know, uh, um, or no, uh, Voyage Home, I think it was, um, you know, about the whales, saving the whales. But um, start the next generation. Um, it ran for seven years. Then they voluntarily canceled it. Uh, I love the next generation. Uh, it's probably my favorite of all the series. Um, introduced Captain Picard and the rest of the crew. Uh, the first season, and I've just got to be honest. The first season was lackluster. But that is the way it is with a lot of series. You just can't go out of the gate being a blast every time. Um, but it got really good after that. Um, and for a while, that's where they based a lot of the 
uh, uh, TV series on their template of Next Generation. And um, it had a good run. It made me sad when they voluntarily canceled it because they just I thought they were done. You know, and I could see a certain wisdom in that. And then uh, you had Deep Space Nine. Um, I didn't like it as much, but then um, somebody decided to take Star Trek and put it on a cable channel. I can't even remember na the name of the ca cable channel. Not everybody had cable back then, and I didn't. I still haven't seen the very last episodes of Deep Space Nine. Star Trek Voyager came out, and that that was on whatever cable channel it was back then. I didn't see Star Trek Voyager until they, until they started putting it in reruns. I mean, I lived in a rural area until DirecTV came out, uh, or, or or Dish. I, I didn't see them because, I mean, back then you, you, you couldn't stream, you couldn't run up to the store and rent them. There was no Redbox. I mean, there was video stores, but they hadn't put them out on video cassette, so that's going to be a reoccurring theme history repeating itself in this story so um, they made some next generation movies they were pretty good you know and then they made Star Trek Generations it was awesome um, no movies perfect I, I had some nitpicks about it but they did what I wanted them to do is bring the old crew uh, somehow and and touch the new crew you know um, to make the picture more complete though they did that in the original series or the next generation a little bit um, but they never did it with Kirk I wanted to see Kirk and Picard together and they did thank you thank you Ronald Moore so then um, you know, Voyager uh, finally ended kind of abruptly. That's another thing about history repeating itself in this franchise and other franchise. Um, they'll cancel a series and they say, "Oh, whoa, well, we gotta, we gotta put an ending on this." Um, so the last episode of Voyager was like, "Oh, wow, well, it's over that quick." Um, then, you know, but well, at least it didn't get the Firefly treatment, which was just shut it down, you know. But then again, Firefly got a movie called Serenity. But and then we went on Long Space, and we went. We had some a few movies, uh, Next Generation movies, um, and then we got Star Trek Enterprise, which went before the original series, you know, before Kirk and crew. Um, I enjoyed that series. Um, it's pretty good. I mean, you can definitely tell that people made the Next Generation and Deep Space Nine and Voyager made uh, Enterprise. But, uh, you know, it took a while for it to get going. Uh, but it got abruptly canceled. And it was like, bam, it's over. Uh, you know, uh, I hate it when they do that, you know. If you're going to end this series, have a blowout. Um, so anyway, we go a long time w without a Star Trek series on TV. It was, was where it began. It's where it's best at. And we get some movies. And, um, you know, of course, uh, the J.J. Abrams 2009 reboot. And he got away with a little trick there about you know going back in time and changing the timeline, uh, but it worked not good enough for me. Uh, I thought the first movie was a hoot. It was uh, Star Warsy, but it was good. I mean, I enjoyed it. I had high hopes, 
and then we had uh, Into Darkness, which was basically re rebooting the Wrath of Khan. You know, and if you go to other ch uh, franchise, like Battlestar Galactica, you've got Ronald Moore had kind of did that already. He and it even says in the series, you know. It's the same thing happening over again, but people change their roles. It's not what they did with Into Darkness, and the, the movie was beautiful, but uh, I was a little disappointed. And then Into uh, um, Star Trek Beyond came out. The trailers were horrible because you know a lot of people pay more attention. There's a lot more information. You know, the guy that directed the Fast and Furious, some of the Fast and Furious movies. We saw a motorcycle and hand grabs and, uh, oh, this is awful, you know. But, um, I did go to see it in a movie, especially after I heard the reviews were good. I, I decided to wait. And um, I went to the movies and it was good. It was good. I highly recommend it. Star Trek Beyond is a good Star Trek movie. It is. They did a few things like it's been done before. They destroyed the Enterprise again. But, I mean, it's a warship. I guess. But, um, now, uh, uh, last year we had this, uh, Star Trek Discovery come out back on TV where it should be. Um, but they... They put it between a time period of the original series pilot with Captain Kirk and you know, see how is it see this is already getting complicated. You know, they they, they put it into a little time period between like a Star Trek Enterprise and the original series pilot. Yeah, that's what it is. And I'm thinking, why did you limit yourself? I mean, I, I'm all for being creative, and you know, you can pull creativity out of yourself, but why put it in? I mean, stuff has happened in Enterprise, and stuff has happened in the original series. So you're kind of, you know, painted yourself into a corner of what you can do. Make it in the future. I mean, that's what I thought it would be would be out past Voyager in time or in the next generation. That's what I wanted. But they didn't. So let's go watch it anyway though. So I went and watched it. I came home from work and I watched it and in the first episode the lead character, Michael, is a gal. It's no big deal but uh, it, it'll look confusing but um, she's a great actress. I mean everybody on that series is a great actor. But and the special effects are great, but in the first episode, I believe she disobeys a direct order, fly by only. Um, she interacts with the Klingons, uh, you know, a no-no, prime directive, all that stuff. Then she comes back to Enterprise and commits a mutiny. already, you know, this is not how Starfleet works. This is not how the Space Navy works, because that's what Star Trek is, you know. The Federation, it's basically Space Navy. <laughs> uh, after that first offense, she would have just been probably been kicked out. So, <laughs> what's, you know, she's supposed to be, I, I guess, so good Does it remind you of anybody, any other character in Star Wars? She's so good. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, then they said, "Well, we're not only going to put the first. <laughs> we're going to put the first two episodes on TV on CBS, where it's home. But then you have to subscribe to a streaming service." To see the rest of them, only the United States. The rest of the world can see them. 
<laughs> oh man. You know, I already subscribed to Prime, Amazon Prime, and Netflix, and all these other services that are wanting your money, you know. But you had all that stuff up. I mean, that's a lot of TV, that's a lot of content, and it's a lot of money. So, oh man. Uh, uh, there's a recurring theme here. So, where we got? Where we at? <laughs> Now, let's come up to speed. We're right now, uh, Discovery's making a, you know, a new season. I haven't seen all the first season. I'm not going to. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not subscribing for that one series. And uh, the first episode, you know, she does all this stupid stuff. So, and then, you know, there's a certain amount of plagiarism. <laughs> They're talking about... <laughs> You know, there was a video game that had like Spore Drive and uh, characters that looked like, I mean, so, uh, come to find out, um, CBS has the rights for TV, Paramount has the rights for the movies. So, <laughs> there's a certain amount of... <laughs> Uh, you, you're painting yourself into corners again. It's, it's all about money and rights and all that stuff, you know. There's people out there who want to create some really good content. Um, there's people that make Star Trek that are fans. Which leads me to today's, what I found out about today. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, uh, with YouTube uh, and... Um, you know, computer programs and stuff, that you can make your own fan-made shorts, movies. There's Star Trek, uh, there's some fan-made, uh, like Axanar, it looks really great. Um, and Star Trek Continues is awesome. But CBS has decided to, uh, they're not going to make any money off of it, so they're shutting them all down. And the movies, come to find out, they're not allowed to, I think it's Paramount, they're not allowed to resemble anything too close to this original series. It's, it's a mess. It's all about money and power. The guy that runs CBS, uh, from what I gather, he doesn't like sci-fi. And he, uh, well, I guess he's um, being uh, prosecuted for uh, sexual uh, offenses. Anyway, so it's almost like, um, you know, the, the X-Men are owned by one company and Marvel is, owns all the other characters. And then Sony had Spider-Man. You know, it's just a mess. So they all need to be under one house. But anyway, so we come today. You know, last week Chris Pine and Mr. Hemsworth says, uh, you know, we're not going to be in another movie because you're not going to pay us a month. But as much as you said you'd pay us, what does that tell you? <laughs> Say, hey, if we need you to take a cut and pay. I mean, there's record profits for all these companies. But we can't pay you. And I'm not just talking about the movie companies. I'm talking about every company, every big corporation. So you, you've got that mess. And then today, <clears throat> I've got an article here that I want to read you. Um, there's this. Um, it's by Ural Gamer. And uh, I'll just read it to you. Um, because it was a pretty good short article. A fan-made recreation of the Enterprise from Star Trek The Next Generation has been pulled offline following a cease and desist order. Stage 9 was a two-year-old fan project that let users explore a virtual recreation of the Enterprise D, the spaceship made famous by the Next Generation TV show. It was a hugely detailed virtual recreation 
was built using the Unreal Game Engine and was available on PC as well as virtual reality headsets. You can freely roam the ship, travel to various decks, enter rooms, interact with objects, and even fire a phaser. I'm going to put links to this article and a YouTube video in another article. In a video update, the head of the project, who goes by the name Scragnog, explained they had no choice but to can Stage 9 after lawyers from CBS refused to budge on their cease and desist. Throughout the project, the developers made it clear Stage 9 was not an officially licensed endeavor with no affiliation with CBS or Paramount. They made it clear that this is fan-made and they have no affiliation. We are just fans creating art, Scragnog said. I thought we'd made that pretty clear. In 2017, a year after work on Stage 9 began, Ubisoft released a Star Trek Bridge Crew, a game that lets players work at a station on the bridge. This year, it saw an Enterprise D DLC. Internally, this was an exciting development, but at the same time, it concerned us, uh, Scragnog said. The team took a break from the issuing updates to the game, while in the background, it worked on what would have been the 11th update for Stage 9, and explored the possibility of pitching the project to CBS as a potentially officially licensed piece of software. Through it all, we knew it could end at any point, Scragnog said. Then, on December 12th, or I apologize, September 12th, the cease and desist letter from CBS lawyers arrived. The decision was made to pull all the Stage 9 public facing channels into lockdown while the team tried to convince CBS to change its mind. They suggested tweaking the project to ditch the inclusion of VR, ditch the use of Enterprise D specifically, and even change the name. But CBS insisted that Stage 9 end. So now it has. Scragnog has a YouTube video, an emotional goodbye to Stage 9, which clearly meant a lot to him. There are plenty of thank yous to the people who helped make it happen. There's some understandable anger directed at CBS in there too. CBS and Paramount have issued guidelines for fans making Star Trek fan films, insisting CBS and Paramount Pictures will not object to or take legal action against Star Trek fan productions that are non-professional and amateur, as long as they meet the guidelines. It seems that Stage 9, though, the rules were a little different. And there's another article by Sci-Fi Wire which I have a hate-love relationship with sci-fi, Stargate, Firefly. Let's see. The team's one hope of becoming reinstated online rested with a 2016 interview given by John Van Sitters, CBS's Vice President for Product Development while appearing in the fifth episode of Engage, the official Star Trek podcast, Sitters touched upon the impact of fans and their passion of creating fan-based homages. There is a litany of official guidelines and rules and prohibitions. He says, I quote Mr. Sitters, We want fans involved, very much so. We just want them involved in the right way that's going to help us evolve and bring Star Trek to a bigger and brighter future. Sitters said on the podcast, it's easy to think that Star Trek in terms of fan initiatives is all about fan films, and that's not it at all. We've long encouraged fan creativity and fan participation in Star Trek. Fans are not going to hear from us. They're not going to, they're not going to get a phone call. They're not going to get an email. They're not going to get anything that is going to ruin their day one way or another and make them feel bad like what they've done is anything wrong. That was in reference to fan-made films like Axanar, Continues, and some others. With that in mind, Stage 9 reached out twice, but they have yet to receive a response from Sitters. 
There was an Scragnog insists that there was an awareness among developers that no money could be made from any facets of stage nine. That's one of the prohibitions in that nobody involved with the project sought any financial gain. He even conceived of a way in to pitch the simulation of CBS in an effort to be fully accredited licensee. But I guess it was too cumbersome a task, it says. While the official channels have been set down, you can still view a nearly 20-minute walkthrough of the highly detailed ship recreation. Of course, the next generation fans can take solace in the fact that star Patrick Stewart will keep an up show's story going in an upcoming series centering around an older Jean-Luc Picard. So, stage nine, and um, I've watched a few videos. I knew about this before this video I'm making now, and um, it was awesome. I mean, you could walk through the entire Enterprise D you could walk outside the Enterprise along the hull. It was attached to Deep Space Nine. It was docked. You could get onto Deep Space Nine and walk around. I mean, you could keep be in all the rooms of the Enterprise D, walk through the nacelles. It's amazing. You'd go through the, the primary shuttle bay, which was never on the TV show. I mean, it was just amazing. And they shut it down. They weren't making any money off this. They used their own time and money on this. And they shut it down. You know, I'm sure there's legal reasons, but, you know, with all the unnecessary crap going on, I mean, it's tarnished. And just, and like my other love, Star Wars. You know, I didn't like The Last Jedi. So, I didn't boycott Star Wars, but I wasn't incentivized to go see Solo. I wasn't excited. I don't trust Lucasfilm anymore. And now, I don't trust CBS. Not anymore. I, I, they're going to make some more series and some more shorts about Discovery and, you know, Picard uh, TV. Or I don't know what it's going to be. They want me to subscribe they want me to purchase their content but they're making it really hard it doesn't have to be this hard put star trek on tv where it's supposed to be and you make money from ads because people tune in because it's good product but you know star trek in the darkness was a, a blip but beyond was good so i was kind of looking forward to the next one even though um, um, the the actor that played Chekhov, he unfortunately was in an accident. Anton, I believe his name was. So, if I was them, I wouldn't make any more movies. Well, no more, no more J.J. Abrams reboot movies. With uh, the passing of that star, and now Chris Pine and Mr. Hem Hemsworth are not going to participate because you're. Tell them to take a pay cut. Just don't make it. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Figure something else out. If you want to make movies. But they're stuck to this timeline, you see. They're stuck to certain uh, restrictions imposed by CBS. So I don't know what they're going to do. They painted themselves in the corners. So, and then CBS, you know... <laughs> You know, there's a certain amount of backlash from fans on the Star Wars side, and you're just asking for it on the Star Trek fans. I mean, it's already been there with the Abrams reboot, but um, you're just going to make it toxic. You know, and there's one of the stars on Discovery who said, oh, they'll go watch it. Well, no. 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 I've seen, you know, look at Star Wars. <laughs> You know, you, you, you piss the fans off. That's your bread and butter. What happened? None of this makes any sense. And it's history repeating itself. 
And you see it in politics today, too. Folks, gotta either got well out learn if we really want to go toward this utopian idea of our species, we have to go toward it and quit taking two steps forward and one step back. You know, I mean, in Star Trek, there's universal health care. Other countries have it. It's not that hard. Well, it is hard, isn't it? Get that human emotion. Greed. And this is what this is all about, too. Greed. Power. So, that's my Star Trek, um, Star Trek thoughts. And, um, We'll see what happens. Thanks for watching and live prosperly and long.